you start to realize it's it's sort of like death by a thousand paper cuts where you know you you do this one little thing and you accept it and then you do this next little thing and you accept it and you keep going you keep going you keep going you keep going until literally it was like seven years later welcome to obsessed show a podcast that is designed to inspire featuring some of the most creative people in the world i'm your host josh miles let's talk about today's episode Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Carlos Musquez, Executive Creative Director at Catalyst Marketing Agency, where he's bringing his brand of creative excellence to the B2B branding space, something that is near and dear to my heart. You may remember Carlos from episode 143 of Obsessed Show when he was the Executive Creative Director at ELA. Since then, a lot has changed. We're gonna catch up with him on what's new, what's the same, and what he's looking forward to next. So without further ado, Please enjoy this second conversation with Carlos Musquez. Okay, kids, all the way from Los Angeles, I'm chatting with Carlos Musquez. Hey, Los, welcome to Obsessed Show. What's happening, man? Good to see you again. It's, it's good, good to, to have, have you back. Me. Yeah, man, it's been a while. It's been, been, a, been a long while. A lot's happened since the last time we spoke. Man, uh, so much has happened. So many things uh, in particular, over the past few years since we chatted originally, I've been following your Instagram and your escapades of grilling various meats. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You're making me drool from three time zones away. You know, uh, I, I have no endorsement here whatsoever. I have no affiliation with them, but Traeger Grills has been something that uh, I absolutely fell in love with. I got to say they got an amazing product and I was reluctant moving from gas grills and charcoal grills to a wood pellet grill. And I did. And it's become such an awesome hobby to have, to learn. It's like, you know, again, it, it, you hearken back to the craft of art direction and stuff we do in our world. I just love the idea of, 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 you know, smoking meat and, and, and crafting a meal. It's been tons of fun. So yeah, if you look at my Instagram, it kind of feels like I'm a influencer for Traeger, which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> yes. Hashtag not sponsored. Exactly. Yeah. My uh, best friend, Tori has a competing product. I don't think his is trigger. It's i uh, I'm not going to come up with a brand, but we, uh, we had some steaks on his pellet grill <clears throat> last weekend and they were, they're just amazing. It's just like wipe the tears from your eyes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I tell, I tell all my friends that, that ask me like, you know, what's it like converting? I'm like, come on. It's like cheating. It really is. It, it, <laughs> it has an app. It gives you all these great recipes. If you, if you kind of don't know what you're doing, but you want to get into it, Pellet grills are the way to go. It's really hard to mess some things up. And once you get the hang of it, man, you can make some awesome stuff. I've done briskets and tri-tips that are big out here in the, the West Coast, um, ribs, you name it. I've done it. And it's uh, it's been so much fun and so rewarding to be able to learn a new craft and to you know kind of dive into something other than you know what you're normally doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's been it's been quite the treat. And you know, uh, there's quite a community. You talk about brand advocacy, or I always like to say, turning brand awareness into brand evangelism. Man, they have the Traeger Nation. They have all the. It's it's pretty crazy what's out there. There's a lot of people that follow it. So a lot of fun, great community. Uh, learn new stuff, and you know what? The the outcome is you get to eat some really great meals. So there's <laughs> that. You know, pair it with a nice uh nice bottle of wine or your favorite beer or something. It's a it's, it doesn't suck. I tell you that. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, I'm sure most of our listeners did not come to hear meat chats. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, hard to mess it up. It's hard to burn it. Uh, how's this as a transition, but in the creative industry, sometimes we can burn out. <laughs> I realize you were, uh, dealing with a little bit of that and stepped away from agency life for a little bit before you found your new role. So tell us a little bit about, uh, that transition. It's like you're a pro, man. What a transition. That was that was <laughs> like it was almost planned. And uh, everybody listening, that was not planned. That was just your <laughs> pure pro transition right there. Yeah, let's talk about burnout. I mean, I'm third almost 30 years into this uh this industry, which has been phenomenal for me. I mean, I I can't uh, I every client, every agency, every person I've worked with, I can't thank them all enough for you know, all that I've got from them and, you know, um, get the opportunity to work with um, just incredible minds and, and craft some, you know, incredible work. But, you know, if you live in this industry long enough, you start to really, especially from my time to now, you really start to understand that there was a way of being 
that we grew up in is it's, it's sort of like, what do people call it? The hustle culture. And in LA Hollywood, it's even more, man, I got to tell you with Hollywood hustle and the film music industry, all the things, you know, you feel it all over New York, every major Metro has it. Um, but in LA, it seemed to be sort of ran rampant over the last few years, for sure. Last 10 years. And and it's kind of like this by any means necessary sort of approach to the work. And it's great. I mean, you know, I was uh, I was working for like the last seven years in that environment, you know, hardcore in Hollywood, hardcore in, you know, advert to the, you know, kind of intersection of advertising and, and uh, entertainment and all of that. And you get caught up in it. It's a frenzy, you know, and after so many years, even in the traditional agency space, you start to realize that the world changes, but the industry hadn't changed around us. The industry was still holding on tight to its ways that it, that it always sort of did things, which was, you know, sort of glorifying this notion of, um, you know, 12 plus hour days, you know, we're burning the midnight oil kind of a thing by any means necessary. Every creative on this um, podcast right now that's listening is going to shake their head and go, yeah, yeah, I understand that, you know, <laughs> right. um, hardcore boss. Too close that, to home. <laughs> yeah, you know, it just is. It's just the industry. It's just what it is. And there's no way of getting around it, really, um, because we kind of perpetuate it. And that was something that I started to realize where, you know, the the beginning of the end of that for me was, you know, one night I was it was like a Sunday night. We we're working on a project. And I wouldn't even say I mean, every project, in my opinion, it is, um, you know, gets the same attention, whether it's a, you know, 10 million dollar big brand campaign or, you know, a, a cocktail napkin. It doesn't much matter what it is. We're but we were working on something that really wasn't, uh, didn't really warrant the sort of stress associated with it. And late Sunday night, you know, we were stressed over the work big time, looked at it, it's not good enough, all the things, you know, and, and, and kind of hit a wall. And I started to realize, kind of set back in my seat at the time and said, wait a minute, what am I doing? What's going on? And you start to realize it's it's sort of like, death by a thousand paper cuts where, you know, you, you do this one little thing and you accept it. And then you do this next little thing and you accept it and you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going until literally it was like seven years later. Um, in that sort of mindset where I started to realize like, wait a minute, I'm starting to sacrifice my own personal morals, my own personal ideals and, and sort of how I think great creativity can, can thrive and, and, and flourish. And, and, and don't get me wrong. We may, we were making freaking awesome work. And, and my past agency LA is still making freaking awesome work. They're, they're a killer agency doing awesome work. But for me, I find myself, I found myself in a place of like, wait a minute, I, I don't really know who I am creatively anymore. Love the work, love the clients, love all the things that was happening, but didn't really love who I was and kind of how I was operating. And especially when you get into a you know, an executive role, you know, you have so much influence and I pride myself on that. And as you know, from my past interviews and anybody that knows me knows that, you know, I love to preach and teach and I love to give back. I've had some awesome mentors. And, and so you kind of have to keep yourself in check and start to realize. So I took a step back and said, wait a minute, am I really making the best work of my life? Yes. But am I making the best work of my life the best way I can? And that was something that hit me really hard. So I decided, look, no, I'm going to, I got to kind of step down from this. I got to, I got to get away from it. I was super stressed out, major commutes, hardcore working all the time, you know, nose to the grindstone, just, you know, really strangling the work and strangling the team to be as, as good as you possibly can. And, and, and again, the work was phenomenal. We're doing some really great stuff. So that there, I, there is. And my guess is it, too, it was like, this is going on in your head. This isn't other people coming to you saying, let's get your act together. This, this is, is you telling that. yourself like, man, this isn't how I want to do things. 100%. And, and you start to realize like, wait a minute, you know, you have this self-realization. And so I think, you know, what I learned out of all of this was self-awareness, really being self-aware and honest with yourself and saying, wait a minute, am I doing the thing that I really want to do? Am I doing it the way that I want to do it? And do I feel good about it? And, you know, as much as I felt great about the work, I mean, there was pitches, there were times when we would put so much effort on the pitch and so much emphasis that if we didn't win, it was soul crushing, you know, it was just these peaks and valleys and you know what, that's good. And as a younger creative, I, you know, I I really thrived on that. And I think some people do thrive on that, but now, as I kind of look into it, I go, wait a minute, you know, my goal in life was to make awesome work with awesome people, having a lot of fun. 
and, and doing it in a healthy way. And then, you know, in, insert pandemic, <laughs> insert crazy world that's happening, <laughs> that's insert remote working, insert, how do we transition from, you know, um, you know, boards in a physical office with, you know, pages and pages of creative on them with, you know, everybody in one room to everybody's on a zoom call now and, and really trying hard to, you know, replicate all that. So there's just a lot of stress and a lot of change in my life around it. So, you know, long story short was I decided, look, I'm going to go my way and I'm going to take some time off. Didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't know what it was, but I knew that what was happening to me physically, mentally, emotionally just wasn't healthy. And um, that's important for everybody to understand. I think that's what I wanted to really talk about here was, you know, being self-aware, you know, it, there's different situations for everybody. And I'm seeing, not saying the Hollywood hustle isn't the best for some it is, you know, some people thrive in that situation and love it. And that's great. Go do that if that's what you want to do, but don't allow yourself out of some kind of false loyalty to yourself or to anybody else to stay in a situation that just you're not being able to be the best you, you know, and I think that's, it's, it's better for you and it's better for the, um, you know, the subsequent parties involved because they're not getting the best out of you. And I, that's what I felt was like time for me to take a step back, take a break. Yeah. You know, maybe I even joked. do that on purpose for a year or two, like go, go into some <laughs> boiler room situation and learn about yourself and like, you know, refine that sword in the fire kind of thing. But it's probably not a good long-term fit for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a long-term fit. And, you know, some people, you know, have the luxury of being able to take some time off and, you know, n- no worries and others, it's much more difficult, but um, whether it's, you know, even five minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, meditating, whatever, just kind of get in your own head, or it's, you know, a month or a week or a year or two, you know, whatever it is, you know, I urge everybody just to, you know, kind of be honest with yourself, be self-aware because it, it really did. It made a huge difference. It was really interesting because I walked away from it and the things that I saw, and maybe it's my age, maybe it's a little bit of 30 years of, you know, being in the same situation, you know, the things that I saw that I decided that I, you know what, my next stage in, in my career is going to be a little bit more altruistic. And so when I walked away from that situation, super damn proud of the work, super damn proud of all the relationships and the people and all the things that I've done. Um, I started to realize that st- standing on the stage at con or getting a Clio award or making the next best, whatever, <clears throat> wasn't necessarily the thing that drove me anymore. What drove me and what does continue to drive me is this notion of helping people, giving back. I wanted to give back a little bit more, really find some situations where I could I could make a difference, take my expertise, you know, all of my almost 30 years of knowledge and experience and, you know, bring it to life and, and do what I'm doing here. You know, it's like, you know, I feel so incredibly grateful for some of the people I've had around me. And you, for me, mentioned some of them, Cameron Young, um, you know, Luis Camano, there's, you know, my old writing partner and my old creative director from my young days. They're incredible people that just taught me so much and continue to teach me so much um, about doing what feels right for you, you know, doing what's good for you. So anyway, so I took some time off and uh, decided I'm out, I'm going to go drive a tram at Disneyland or something, you know, and and that was the joke, you know, (laughs) and turns out what I actually did was just started to grill a lot of meat. See, bringing it full circle. Um, And then from there, I, I just decided to take time. So I took time off and took a couple of vacations with my family. We have a place out in Sedona, which is magical and amazing. And so mm. we were, we were out there and that led me to, you know, once you kind of clear your head, you know, and talking to all my friends, like, Oh, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Everybody expected me to go start my own agency or, you know, go to, you know, go to a big shop, like a, you know, a Shide or a Goodby or something like that. And, you know, and I would tell people, I don't know, man, I'm not, I'm too close. I'm not qualified to answer that right now. I can't, uh, I don't have enough information to tell you what I'm going to do next. So the distance was, was pretty phenomenal and being able to have that luxury to be able to get away, just kind of look inside and go, what did I love about what I was doing? And what didn't I love about what I was doing and where do I want to go? And, you know, it, that was just, just such a gift. And, and I think that was sort of a turning point was, you know, being out there in Sedona, sitting there, being surrounded by that beautiful scenery. And it's, it's, it was just so incredibly disconnecting that you, you know, from the Hollywood hustle kind of a thing where you go, wow. Okay. Now what? And, and that was mm-hmm. liberating, you know, super liberating. 
Sedona is just a magical place. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. Absolutely is. So there I am in Sedona and, you know, curiosity kills the creative director. You can't, uh, you can't, you can't keep us down for that long. Um, and of course I just, I popped open, you know, LinkedIn or whatever. And I just start looking at what, you know, what's out there. I don't even know what's out there. What do I want to do? So I started looking at every possible Avenue. I remember when I was, um, in school, my first design class, I had a design instructor who asked the, the class, what, what is design? And he walks in with two CA magazines and he um, places one neatly on a table and then he throws one across the room. And we all thought he was insane. And he says, who can tell me what's design? And, you know, he basically came back and said, listen, the, the, the one that I sat down and purposely place there was designed. I, I had intention to it. The one that I just threw isn't necessarily designed. And uh, and we kind of blew our minds when you start to think about that. And then he says, so when you think about your career paths, anything that is purposely made and it's made by man, it's not naturally made is designed. So your avenue to go into a design career is anything that's basically purposely made. And you start to like, you know, open your brain up and go, wait a minute, it's not just about graphic design. It can be like, you know, fashion design, uh, furniture design, architecture, you know, interior design, it's, it's so many things you could do. And when I'm in Sedona, I instantly flash back to that and I go, oh my gosh, what's next? What could I do? You know, where am I going to go? And, you know, a big part of me was down a path of starting my own creative consultancy and um, really looking at the agency model and, and taking what I learned over the last, you know, kind of six years and, and doing this sort of hybrid um, studio approach. And, and cause I loved, you know, like, I always ask myself, when am I at my happiest? It's, you know, when I'm on set, when I'm making stuff, you know, when I'm in it, you know, I just, I still, to this day, still love doing that. So, and I've built some great relationships and, um, you know, have a lot of resources. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'm going to go out and do that. So I sort of down this path doing that thinking, no matter what, I'm going to, I'll end up consulting. And then, as I said, curiosity killed the creative director. I started looking at LinkedIn and I saw this job description um, and I read it. And I, I think I told you last time we spoke, I got this. Is, I was I was literally looking around like this is this is some BS right here. Somebody's punking me. They have to be punking me because there's no way that <laughs> this very job elaborate was joke. <laughs> yeah, it was a very elaborate joke. And I, and I honestly I was like. I was pompous enough to think that somebody probably was punking me, but I'm like, this is, this is a very elaborate joke because this job description literally described every, every ounce of my being. It was like, so perfect. I was like, this is, this is a, this cannot be, this is an absolute joke. And so I replied to it out of just morbid curiosity. I wasn't really, you know, not necessarily interested per se, but I, I wasn't not interested. It was just kind of like, I don't know what I'm, I got to start somewhere. So why don't I just go and apply to this thing? And I did. And I got a call from the recruiter and spoke with this very nice lady about it. And, you know, um, how the story goes was, oh, this is a, you know, small independent B2B shop in Denver, Colorado. And instantly you hear small B2B shop in Denver, Colorado, and you go, wah, wah, no, I'm out. No, thank you. That's not every box you wanted to check was just unchecked. (laughs) It was completely unchecked. And it made, it made absolutely no sense for me. So that was, that was kind of the, the beginning of it all. And, um, and so, but at the, at, at the um, end of that conversation with the recruiter, it was like, she said to me, but you have to meet the two ladies that own the company. Um, and I said, that'd be great. I had a million questions as you can imagine. And, um, you know, I was just kind of thinking about, do I, do I want a rebound job? Is that what I'm looking for? Something that I could just get into to do and, you know, it's not going to be serious or not serious. So I didn't know what the heck I wanted. It was just crazy at the time. And I was all avenues. I was consulting for another agency during the time. And then, um, all the things happened and, um, but I kept the door open and I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to, my wife gave me some great advice. She said, it doesn't matter what your gut tells you, what your head tells you. Don't shut any doors yet. Just keep them all open until something comes to you. Because the thing that you're not looking for is going to be the thing that you're going to end up going for. You don't know what you want. So, so don't discount anything. And it's very, very easy for us to go, oh, it's not insert, you know, a million checkboxes here. And you go, so I did. I left it open. And um 
And then the story goes so much deeper than that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, tell us a little bit about, I mean, you've given us the high level, the the boxes that it didn't check, but tell us, tell us a little bit more about who Catalyst is, like what kind of agency is this and a little bit about how they're shaped. Great. So yeah, so that gets me to the second part of the story. The second part of the story is the, the best. I was working with a buddy of mine. His name's Kevin Mayer, and he was the um, basically the CMO at BJ's Restaurants at the time. And uh, he calls me literally that same week that I was in Sedona. He called me and says, hey, man, I got a, um, a big shoot that I'm working on, and um, I, I just need somebody to help me handle it. Can you, can you help me handle it? So I said, yes. So... I kind of come in as just a creative consultant for him to handle this shoot. And it's, it's a big lifestyle shoot for, for them. And um, you know, he wanted to get really efficient with it. So I helped him put together a team and the whole thing. And, and it was just kind of like a friends and family, buddy to buddy sort of situation. I just did it because I love doing it and I hadn't worked with this guy in a long time and it's been a while. So um, I mentioned this to you before and last time we chatted, but the shoot was supposed to be in Michigan. And um, then at the last minute to get switched to Denver, which I thought was Again, is somebody punking me? This is ridiculous, right? So here I go. I head off to Denver. Denver. I have an incredible shoot out there. The the BJ's team was awesome. And it was such a great thing to do. And it was so fun to be able to just kind of pick up a project pretty quickly and and, and just have some fun. And and that made me sort of solidified my, this is what I want to do. I just want to work with cool people and do fun things. I'm not out for any other, anything other than that. And so that happened, but it allowed me to go meet with the uh, owners of Catalyst, Robin Emiliani and Jim Schwartz two incredibly tenacious, wonderful women that um, I am so lucky to have met. And so this meeting, we go meet at a restaurant in in Denver and we kind of hang out and it's like, it was literally our first in-person meeting. I had some conversations beforehand. So um, traditionally Catalyst is a B2B marketing agency, you know, clients like Microsoft, Adobe, some big enterprise level, a lot of tech, um, some fuel companies, some, a lot of that kind of thing hardcore B2B, sales enablement, all of that stuff, right? And it's sort of, not that I don't know it, but it wasn't my world. It wasn't the world that I came from where I'm general market advertising, you know, big, big, big integrated campaigns and, you know, experiential and all that stuff. Very different world. But, you know, I did touch and dabble in B2B in the past. I thought, okay, interesting. You know, I think we could say it, you know, and and address it that B2B isn't known for its amazing creative approach to, you know, the industry. It's, it's really about boots on the ground. You know, um, you really, it's about the ROI. It really is about getting out there and making something that's going to perform. It's, it's really performance marketing at its best. Right. And which all marketing should be on some level, but what I've realized over the years is that B2B, um, arms of companies sort of struggle with brand and more general market advertising sides or product sides and sort of they're really have the um the pressure on them to get sales and to convert right it's really about conversion so i was intrigued because well b2b i don't really you know whatever but i had a sort of a, a, a mission in my mind and my mission was um after talking with jim and robin on the phone in particular uh jim uh I liked what they had to say. They're very tenacious. They had a they had a they had a gut and a vision for what they wanted to create. And, and I thought, okay, uh, I like them as just people. They're great people and you know, really smart marketers, all that stuff. But they said something to me that that as a creative person and any creative person listening, you would your ears would perk up a little bit. And they said, Look, we understand the work sucks right now. They said it. I was like, hmm, interesting. And, and by that, what they meant was it's not hardcore creative. We understand that the work, and let me cl- clarify and qualify, it wasn't that it was bad work. It was work that performed, but it wasn't hyper creative work. And they saw a gap. And the gap was exactly what we talked about, which was the gap between B2C work and B2B work um, is getting closer and closer and closer and closing. And the mediums in which we you know, consume, uh, you know, anything from a brand now are so close together. They overlap and all that. So they said, there's an opportunity to really approach B2B marketing from a more B2C world and bring in some of that B2C thinking, big thinking, different new tactics, you know, new ways to engage and, and creative ideas. So they say this to me and it's like, 
it's like pulling my string. It's, it's literally like, Oh yeah. Hot shot. What, what do you got? What do you, what are you going to say to this? So that conversation turned into what was supposed to be a 45 to an hour conversation was three plus hours long. And we just, you know, emotionally, uh, hit it off, you know, um, spiritually hit it off when it came to, you know, our ideals in, in this industry and what we wanted to do. And, you know, listening to them and listening and sitting across from these two incredible people. And I just looked at them and you could see it on their face, their desire to want to do this. I went, I can make a difference here. And, and so that is really what drove the, probably the biggest decision of my life, which is to walk away from nearly 30 years of building a career down a certain path and totally, you know, zig and do something completely different. And I thought, you know, I thought going into it, I'll be real honest with everybody. When I thought going into it, I thought, well, this is going to be easy. I already know how to build a creative shop. I've done it so many times. You know, I know how to do this. This is not, it turns out there's nothing easy. Nothing's ever easy <laughs> in, in, in the world you think, you know, and whatever sort of chip on your shoulder you have, um, it gets knocked off pretty quickly. So um, I was humbled quite, quite early in the B2B space and realized I don't know B2B. I really don't know how it operates. I don't know what makes it tick. I don't know what makes, you know, what, what makes for great in B2B. And so, you know, it, what it did, it was, it, it forced me to become uh, a student again, which I loved so much, which was diving into the work, diving into these. And still to this day, I'm six ish months in a little bit more than six months. And I am still learning. Like every day I learned something new. I'm like, wait a minute, what is, what did you just say? What is that? And that is awesome. So catalyst is, um, you know, traditionally a B2B agency, they were highly strategically driven and account driven. So they had, you know, hardcore strategy and hardcore account and account planning, and they outsourced all their creative. Like basically I walked into a creative team of mm. like, um, and everything else was. I got to think well, that doesn't work for you. You're such a culture guy. You're such a create, you're such a, you're so passionate about the work product itself. Um, and and then you add this challenge of you're in Los Angeles, they're in Denver. You know, I'm I'm curious to hear how how these pieces work together. Yeah. So that, that I mean, you said it just right. And and again, let's go let's go way back and go the traditional way. What's the traditional way? What did I grow up in? I grew up in, you know, brick and mortar agencies that had creative departments. And you you walked in and there's 20, 30, 200 people, whatever it was. And your team, whatever group you're in, you were there together and you, you, you sat together and you brainstormed together and you put stuff on the walls and sticky notes and all the things, you know, you, 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 you pissed off work and went to a movie together to get inspiration. You did all of those things. It was the togetherness was so ingrained in the creative process. And so I think what COVID taught us and taught me was how to keep that same sort of ethos of fuel, that spirit of uh, creative collaboration and and do it in a virtual space. And, and what it really taught me was how to get tight on direction, how to get the best out of the team that's around you, but also how to go the extra mile to keep the team together, you know, um, to, to force those times of let's talk about the work, let's do the thing. So, yeah, I walked into that situation thinking sort of both ways, like, you know, gosh, a, a full-time staff would be probably really great, but also having this, this sort of, um, contractor model. Cause they had a great roster that was pretty consistent. So they were calling on, it was like almost like permalance, if you will. So they were calling on the same people. And, and, and so you're not losing the, um, tribal knowledge on, on an account, which is so important. And you start to build a rapport with them and you kind of get to know who does what, you know, Josh does this and Los does this, and you kind of get to know their talents and their strengths and weaknesses and all that stuff. So it wasn't bad. But what I did notice was it was hard to, it was hard to build a team that was committed to the greater cause of something. And I think that sense of belonging is, is what ultimately shifted my thinking. So I gave it a good go with that. And, you know, um, and that was, it was tough. It was really, really tough to try to understand and, you know, instantly, try to apply what you know to that situation. And it was, it was incredibly difficult. And then obviously everybody's remote. We had people in, you know, uh, North Carolina, we had people in California, we had people in Denver, we have people all over the place. So rallying the troops became uh, very difficult, not because of proc, just purely because of proximity, but purely because here's this guy that 
quote unquote, is the LA creative hotshot coming in here. What the hell is he going to do? Right. I mean, there was a lot of, oh my gosh, what's happening in the agency. So there was a lot of fear, I think, um, and a lot of hope at the same time. And what I found was, um, to answer this question in, in, in the, in the most appropriate way, I think it was less about the physicality in what I'm finding today, even today, still today, as we're six, as I said, six months in, it's about building brand belief. It's about, you know, every action in my head is based on belief. Um, and if you don't believe in something, then it's really hard to act positively on that. So as you're looking at, you know, building an agency model, anybody out there that's doing this and, and, you know, side note, I've, you know, posted some stuff on LinkedIn and anybody can find it. I, I made some new agency friends, some people that I did not know that have their own agencies that have been doing this for a long time that are hyper successful, great agencies, some here, some elsewhere, um, and got some amazing advice, you know, and, and the amazing advice was exactly that. The consistency was, you know, build the brand belief. What do you stand for? Who are you? What do you want to do? What do you want people to show up for every single day? And that sort of brand ethos is sort of what we've been you know, um, really working on and being a champion of creativity isn't enough. It's just not enough. You have to be a champion of humanity. You have to be a champion of that sort of belief system, if you will. And, and getting people that want to be part of that to sign up for it, because once you have that, then the, the rest is a lot easier. So that's the struggle. It continues to be a bit of a struggle as we, as we grow, we are definitely growing, um, we've, you know, lost a few people, gained a few people, all the things. And, and I think as, you know, any agency goes through its, you know, sort of growing pains, we're, we're at that stage, but now I feel now we're at a stage where we know who we are as an agency. And you have to think about this. You insert someone like me into a situation with Jim and Robin who have built an agency. It's their agency. They are, they are the sole owners and, you know, part of the 1%, which is an interesting fact that I just found out 1% of agencies are owned by um, females are female owned, which is something mm -hmm. that is incredible to me. So another driving force behind it, when I met them, I've always gotten along a little bit better with my female counterparts um, for whatever reason I didn't, you know, with my male counterparts, I, but it heads a lot more and a lot more friction and, you know, it just was a different dynamic. And um, so I thought that was a really intriguing thing. So a totally different dynamic being a female owned agency, independent, wanted to turn creative. It's B2B. There's a lot of factors that kind of enter the equation that says, Hmm, let's go there and see what we can do. So, you know, trying to take the best of them and the best of me and put it together and create this new thing that truly is transformative. And what Robin said to me, and you can see it on her face. She's, I mean, they're just, I, I wish you could meet them someday. And I know you will, but they're incredible, you know, people that just, but when they talk about this, you can see it in their eyes. You can feel it. It's palpable. And sitting across from Robin, where she said, I want to transform the industry, not just the agency. And I thought, Okay, if you're it's really ready order. for that, yeah, it's a <laughs> tall order. And and you know, look, we're one agency out of you know thousands and thousands of agencies here in the U.S., let alone the world. Um, and there's other agencies doing what we're doing. We're not we're not the only ones. But um, for what we're doing now, it's it is a tall order to take a bit, traditional B two B strategically driven account driven agency and flip it on its head and be a strategically creatively driven agency that that branches out from both B2B and B2C and kind of bridges that gap and direct to consumer, all the things and, and truly does try to bring that level of thinking to every client. And, you know, again, once you sort of wrap your head around that, you know, it's like anything else. It's, 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 it's a team, you know, you have to, you have to believe in the thing. And, um, recently, you know, me, I'm a, I'm a race guy, you know, I love IndyCar and formula one and all those things. I, I just gave a, I give these creative inspiration sessions to the team all the time. And one of them I've done over the years, and I just did it with the agency was the, the art of the pit stop. Right. Um, and thinking about the pit stop and how everybody has a singular job. And when you focus on that singular job and collectively you focus on the holistic goal and things can go really well or really bad if you, you know, depending on, on uh, how well you do your job. And it's, it's, it's just sort of a metaphor for, you know, if we all know where we're going, and we know what that goal is, whether it's a financial goal, a creative goal, or all of the above, everybody's geared towards that. And you're doing what you do really well. You're an expert in your thing. Um, then 
we like to say the tumblers fall into place, you know what I mean? And, and kind of, um, that's the unlocking of the process, the thing. And um, we're still figuring it out, but it's getting really, really close. The work's getting really, really good, phenomenally better than um, when I walked into what it was. And I thought, well, the work is good, but it, we don't, we're not striving for good. We're not even striving for great. We're striving for award-winning creative work and we got a ways to go still on all of it. But um I think that brand ethos, that brand, you know, the state of being who we are and, and kind of bridging the gap between what Jim and Robin were and what I was doing and bringing those things together was sort of the, probably the hardest part working with, with it all. So, you know, again, proximity wasn't the issue. Freelance team wasn't necessarily the issue. It was about, you know, building a team around you that truly believes in the greater goal. Yeah, I, I think it's so interesting. So many of us work on our clients' brands and build what it means to be part of that organization and what it looks like and how they talk and how they think and how they behave and, you know, advising them on all these things. But most of our agencies are chameleons, you know, where we're whoever our yeah. next client needs us to be. And it's so interesting to kind of focus in around your team and and building that teamwork. And, you know, as you talked, even the humanity of the people <laughs> Who are on uh, that hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. One thing that I loved about, um, catalyst was it was <laughs> sort of foreign. I remember, um, early on I was, if I was going to go, you know, I'm virtual, we're all at home. We all do whatever you need to do. Nobody, when you shut your computer off, nobody knows what you're doing. There's a lot, a level of trust. Right. But, um, I would text my boss, who's Jim. She's the CEO of the company. I would text her and be like, hey, I got to run out to run an errand really quick. Or, hey, I'm going to be on this meeting. Or, hey, I'm going to be over here. And she finally, like three days later, texted me and said, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I just wanted to let you know. She goes, I don't care. I don't care what you do. And I, I, I trust you. That would be the thing. <laughs> and, and so there was this barrier of, uh, it's not even trust. It's just behavior that you're used to, right? And, and so over communication was a thing that I was in before I expected it. My boss expected it. All my other bosses expected it. And, and so here there's a big difference. They really do believe in the human side of the business. And um, to the point where they have a a running sheet where they ask you what's important in your life. For instance, like me picking up my granddaughter at a certain point in time during the day is super important because it's something I have to do, but it's also something I get to do. So I wrote that on there And, and they're like, okay, they let the entire agency know, Hey, Lowe's during this time is unavailable period. Like they really do support it. And um, it was, it was foreign to me and something that I've had to quite frankly, get used to because you, mm-hmm. companies these days just don't support at that level. And what I've started to notice is um, remember, I should say not notice, but remember that distance, that support, that being able to check out at certain times, come back into it really freshens your mind, really frees you up and really gets um, to this notion of camaraderie. And, and, you know, you care that Josh is going to go take his vacation and you want him to have a great vacation because he's going to come back and cover you and you're on vacation. You know, it just really is. And I think we're small enough to do that right now and to have that level of care. And I think the world is, is, is really ripe. For it at the moment, you know, the, the way that we work has changed, you know, virtual is going to be a thing. Um, we want to go back in person when we can, where we can. Um, but we were committed to being an anywhere agency, getting together when we can and, you know, um, and, and doing what we can. But, you know, I think it's this notion of to build belief in something you, you have to practice what you pitch. That's something that we used to say at ELA. And I still say it today. Um, practice what you pitch is so, so important. You can't, you know, theory without putting it into practice is, is nothing. So, um, you know, something I was a little bit reluctant to do as well, like bring some of my past into what I'm doing today. But, you know, I started to realize like, um, my path, there wasn't, how do I say this? There, there wasn't negativity around it. It was just like, I didn't want to, you know, I, I was hesitant to try to replicate things, but then I started to realize there's some things that were very good that I loved that I do want to replicate and bring in here. And, 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 and some of those have made their way into catalyst as well, which again, it's, it's taking the best of what you know from your past and, and trying to build upon it and add new things. So it's been quite the experience, but at the end of the day, I think it's about understanding your team, understanding what drives them as human beings. You know, we try to support them outside of their 
um, day to day, nine to five, sort of, so to speak, you know, their, their passions and, and what they're doing there and, um, bring it inside recently had a creative, um, a, a creative session. I do, them, you know, every other month, basically where we get out and look at work in the world and just expose ourselves as a team to the work. One of our, uh, designers, Gabby is her name, uh, she's a fine artist as well. And so it was on Cinco de Mayo and she, she crafted a beautiful original piece of art, which was a, um, a hand carved print that um, she made exclusively for the agency. And she ended up doing it um, as creative inspiration. And, and she just loved it because she asked me when I first hired her, she goes, I really want to find a way to bridge my fine art and my commercial art. And so, so like little examples like that is, it was really important to her. And I mean, it brought a tear to my eye because she killed it. It was a beautiful piece of art. And uh, now we have original prints. She made original hand pressed mm, prints cool. for everybody in the agency as a sort of a gift. So yeah, it takes, it takes a lot of that. And, and, um, but when you get it right, it's, it's really, really good. It's really rewarding, you know? And, and I think that's what I'm starting to find is, you can get a lot more out of somebody. And what I love going back to the altruistic thing is I want to find a person like a Josh, for instance, and go, how good is Josh? Let me take what Josh already has and try to help Josh be the best at whatever the heck Josh wants to be good at, you know, and do whatever I can. So it's, it's less about, I try to take a step back and it's less about me being a front man per se, but it's me truly leaning into leadership and trying to give back and train and teach and, and our clients, our, our staff, everybody around me to give them everything that I've gotten and, and create an environment. Cause ultimately I benefit from that, right? Because we get amazing work, awesome people. I'm learning just an incredible amount from everybody around me. Um, even the young designers coming up, I'm like, I'm still blown away every time I work with them. And I'm like, you what? Like we have this, uh, an, another Gabby happens to be an intern. I'm working with her on a social media thing. And she shows me like a little calendar and all that. And I kind of explained to her, look, you know, you have to really understand why social media, what do we, what do we want to achieve? So she's doing it for catalyst kind of, you know, we tasked her with come up with a social media plan. She came back with a plan that I was like, Oh my gosh, you are well beyond your years based on getting the input that I gave you hearing it, understanding it and coming back with a recommendation that was super thought through super strategic and really creative. And I was, I was absolutely blown away by it. It gave me so, so much hope that, you know, again, it's not about proximity. It's, it's what it, what it's about is taking the time to really understand and nurture and, and know your role on both sides of the fence. Right. And so, um, we're doing it. I'm creating it. We're, we're, we're giving it a go, man. It's been, uh, it's been tremendous and we've been doing some awesome work for some awesome clients. Well, that's a good segue. I was going to ask you, I know we talked a little bit before we hit record about Empyrean and uh, Steel Series Gaming. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the clients and work that you guys are excited about right now. Oh my gosh. I mean, well, first and foremost, I'm excited about all the work. There's some awesome things happening. Obviously, I can't talk about all of them right now. Um, you know, when I first came in, it was, I was on a, fur, I was on a just, you know, a fever pitch of understanding the clients. What the heck do they do? Um, everything from global fuel companies to Microsoft partners to Adobe, you, you, know, you name it from the B2B proposition, all the things. And um, it, it was it was crazy. I didn't really feel like I could affect the work quite yet. I, I tried to and try to just do the best that I could with, with what I had and what my knowledge was. But now as I kind of lean into it a little bit more, start to understand the business and understand what makes it tick? What I started to realize is creative is creative is creative. It doesn't matter B two B, B two C, or anything else. Which I kind of knew that already. Everybody knows that. It's it's once you understand what it is, then you can you can take it to the next level. But also, there's a key ingredient, and the key ingredient is having clients that truly respect that, that truly understand. No, we want to do something different. So one of the sort of you know core pillars of our agency right now is this notion of challenger brands. Like we want brands that want to be bold. We want brands that want to do something that isn't just, you know, um, business as usual, ubiquitous, give me the tools that I need to check the box and get it out there because that's good enough, you know, and and, and that's fine. And there's a, a role for that. Um, we want brands that are looking to shake up their own industry. So one of those brands is a company called Imperian. 
In Perian, uh, basically what they do is they are a platform for companies to source insurance for or, or HR benefits, basically, for their uh, employees. Um, they don't make the benefits. They are a platform. So they actually had a brand strategy that they uh, launched and it's, you can go to goimperion.com and see it on their website, which is um, this notion of building culture through benefits. And so as that that came to me, I, I, I met the, um, the lead guy there, his name's James uh, that we work with. And he's, he's awesome. Creative guy too. He gets it. And he was like, look, man, we want to do something different. We want to take a different approach to this. We really believe in this notion of culture um, through benefits and benefits that actually matter kind of a thing. So we dug in and we really started to do some, some uh, social listening. And we found, you know, the notion of beer kegs, hula hoops, you know, dogs at the office and, and, um, you know, and pizza on Tuesdays is it's all good. Everybody loves those sort of perks, if you will, but perks were being masked as benefits over the years. And then as COVID happened and we enter this state of where we are today, which is a lot more relative to, um, you know, physical, mental, emotional health and well-being. you know, it's like, we're looking at a holistic, you know, um, wellness plan, you know, at, at the end of the day. So we lean into that, found some great, you know, Reddit stuff, some great things on LinkedIn, some great, just people are out there really talking about this notion that, look, isn't it time for something more meaningful? So we took uh, a complete B2C approach. We looked at the end user, the end user of this being the employees, the, the you know, isn't the ultimate benefit, the fact that we have happiness, right? Happiness is sort of the ultimate benefit. Mm, so yeah. we've rolled out a campaign that um, really revolves around this notion of be the best you and um, took a real B2C approach to it. And, you know, but it's B2B advertising, it's B2B work. It, it, it sort of has a little bit of a B2C bent to it, but we leaned into that and, uh, you know, made some, uh, an amazing motion graphics, cool, you know, spot for them and did awesome visual language key art, brought that entertainment feel to it. Um, very unexpected and and really zigs um, it, where everybody else is zagging in, in the industry. It's not it's not touting the functional benefit per se. It's really getting to the emotional benefit. That's something that I learned in my past life, where you know there's always an emotional connection to the physical benefit. And so bringing a little bit of that thinking to Imperian has been awesome. We're deep in it. It's it's sort of kind of out right now. Maybe by the time this is out, it'll be out there a little bit more. So they're launching it. They're doing it. Um, and super proud of that work. Really, really excited because it was sort of the first one out of the gate for me to take a B2C approach to a B2B client and they love it. They, they are bought all in and we continue to, um, push on that. So that was, that's one that I'm super proud of right now. There's others out there. Air Elite is another one for, um, FBOs, which is private, um, private, uh, basically where the private jets land. Um, you'll start to see some of that work come out. There's a lot of things going on there, but, um, one that I'm particularly proud of that we're working on right now is uh, steel series gaming. That's a past client. I, I worked with them, um, previously, you know, when, when some of the folks that were at Logitech, so I worked with them, they've kind of followed me around, um, my past agency, we did some work for them there. And so this person, her name's Catherine. She's awesome. Incredible CMO. Uh, she called me and said, look, we're, you know, we have like, you know, 40 product launches a year. You know, we had just a ton, just a ton of product launch. She goes, we are just overwhelmed. I need some creative direction help. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to bring this up because this is really important for everybody listening. Um, and so she called me and just said, Hey, I just need you. Can you help me? I just need a creative director. Can you help me? And I said, Hey, look, I'm at this agency. And I, I kind of told her the backstory. And I said, look, I, I would really, I, I would love to help you. I love gaming. And I've done a ton of gaming in, in my most recent past and really fell in love with it and got really good at it. And, um, and she said, uh, okay, cool. I understand your situation. And I said, so I'd have to run it through the agency. And she says, okay, cool. Run it through the agency. I'll do whatever I can to help you. That's fine. And so it was just that relationship and trust that landed this this project that we would never be able to, to, to do like in a, in any other normal situation. So um, it's a big global launch of a new product. I can't talk about it yet. You guys will see it. Um, they launch a lot of stuff, as I said, every, and they're very much into the game changing space. So you'll see it. It was uh, pretty much a dream project for us. And 
brought that in-house, worked directly with them internally, worked as an extension of their internal team, got to work very closely with their um, all their internal folks. And um, it's literally being finished as we speak. So probably in the next two-ish months, um, it'll be out in the world. Everybody will see it posted. Um, but it's fun as hell, man. I mean, it was just so much fun. And being able to exercise that muscle, bring in a B2C client into Catalyst and you know, lean back into a relationship that I just know, love and trust and vice versa. It, it's, it's a great relationship and, you know, it's project work. It's done. It's, it's, that's what it is. I'm here. And, and it was perfect because that's exactly what I wanted to do was kind of bridge those worlds, bring catalyst and show them another level of creative one, which is the steel series sort of work. It's incredible working with our partners at shapes and forms TV as well. Um, doing some amazing things there with, with, um, with them for steel series, uh, they're a CG company and do all the animation for us. Um, it's been an incredible, uh, partnership. So it's kind of like getting the band back together <laughs> a little bit, you know, from <laughs> my past working on that. So I look at the polar opposites and I go Empyrean over here, which is sort of a legacy account for a catalyst that I had nothing to do with. Um, but being able to go into it, influence it and, and take a different approach to it. And then steel series, who is more of a legacy relationship thing for me, totally opposite of B2B and bring that into the fold. And you start to see what emerges is this hybrid agency, this hybrid agency where you go, well, yeah, isn't that what we said we were going to go do? And so you're, we're kind of doing it and it, and it feels, mm. it feels really good. And the work's really awesome. I'm so proud of it. I can't wait to, to, to showcase it, you know, and it's like anything else, you know, we still got to update our brand, update our website, do all the things that all agencies have that they need to do. So, you know, make no mistake, everybody that's listening, you know, nobody, no agency has time to do their own thing for sure. But, um, you know, focus on the work, the rest comes. And that's kind of where I've been Focus on the people focus on how we make the work and what type of work we want to make. And then, um, you know, really focus on the clients. I, I'm all about client love. I, I love our clients and have so much mad respect for them and um, couldn't be more appreciative for what they, you know, entrust us to do every single day. It, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to not be geeky about it, but, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. We all know that. Um, and I apply <laughs> it every day. <laughs> you know, we do have great power and they trust us to, um, they trust us to their brands. And that's something that I've really started to love again, which is building a brand, helping them find their soul and express it out in the world and um, in unique, meaningful ways, right? That's what all agencies really strive to do, but to really own that and to really feel like you're doing it for any, any brand, it doesn't matter if it's a steel series or an Empyrean, they're equal to me um, and they're equally important and they have, um, you know, equal missions and and what they're trying to do. Whereas Steel Series is all about providing the highest level gaming gear. Um, you know, to you know improve your gaming skills. Uh, that's one thing. Imperian trying to help people in the world be their best selves through and build culture through benefits. That's a powerful mission as well. So, and I think it all rubs up against us finding who we are as Catalyst now and finding our own soul and our own purpose and expressing it out in the world and doing our thing. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, my wife kind of joked a little bit and said, well, it kind of looks like you took a mulligan. And I go, what do you mean by that? <laughs> she goes, well, you went to ELA and you did this and you guys did it and it was awesome. And you were really happy doing it and you were doing awesome work with awesome clients and all the things. And then you just kind of got burnt out on that situation. So now you're just doing the same thing in a different situation. And I go, Hmm. You're kind of right. <laughs> you're kind of you're kind of right. You know, it's that uh, as you mentioned, it's a full circle moment, which I think is a is an interesting segue because we asked you last time what you are most obsessed with, and I'm going to ask you that again now. We'll compare the two. I don't I don't remember offhand what you said. Um, I, it was but this could be some, design, creativity, yeah. could be meat, could be racing, could be culture. But I'm curious what you find at this moment you're most obsessed with right now? It's, uh, oh my gosh. Um, I don't remember what I said before either, but I could, I'd venture to say it was something about creating the best work of my life kind of a thing, which I still love. I mean, I still, you can't take that out of a creative person. We always strive, but creativity is sort of like restless, right? You, you're never, you're, you're never satisfied. But honestly, if I, if I set back in, in, answer this question without trying to put on any kind of facade for the world. It's about truly being honest with myself. 
right now I'm obsessed with that. And I'm obsessed with everybody around me um, being honest with themselves because we could easily negotiate with ourselves around things. And when you're honest with yourself and, and, and you just, you look at things from a place of like, but do I truly believe in that? Or do I not believe in that? Am am I okay with this? Or am I not okay with this? Um, Great things happen because if I wasn't honest with myself, let's be honest with each other right now. Catalyst was the very first thing that came after ELA. I would have never taken the very first thing that came after ELA, let alone even remotely thought about a small Denver agency that was a B2B agency, completely polar opposite and probably the last thing that anybody thought I would do. But when I got real honest with myself and my wife is there, you know, your significant others, people around you are really good at, at calling BS on you. Listen to them. <laughs> they, know, <laughs> they know what's going on. She said, um, as, as well as keep the doors open, she said, just remember why you left and what, what was important to you. And why I left and what was important to me was my physical, mental health. And really being honest with myself to be in a situation that I loved with the people around me that I could love and trust and and do great things with and um, sort of remove myself from, uh, you know, what was becoming for me an unhealthy culture. Um, And I wanted to, to change the culture, perpetuate, you know, a new culture and not perpetuate the old way. Um, And for me, that old way, we didn't touch on it was, you know, it's about ageism. It's about, you know, that Hollywood hustle. It's about the old way of working in the industry that really, when your eyes get open to it, you go, oh my goodness, I, I contributed to that inadvertently, you know, and, you know, I, I've, I've been a victim of ageism. I've been a victim of all the things like anybody else. And you don't think of anything of it. You're like, oh, cool, whatever. They don't want me on that business because I'm not the young buck that needs to be there. So you walk away from it and it's no big deal, you know, and you put the young team on it, but you start to realize like, wow, there's some things that just don't, that just don't seem right, you know? And so rather than take those things and continue them, my goal was to take a step back, look at what I can do in my own little bubble, my own little world, and be honest with myself and do things that really benefit a new way of working, a new agency model, um, goodness within the agency, health within our industry. And um, I truly believe that we don't have to kill ourselves to get to great work. We can get to great work in efficient ways, having a lot of fun with great people. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. And, um, you know, doing it for whoever, whoever wants it, you know, and if that's not what they want, I'm cool with that too. You know, like it, it, we're not for everybody. We're going to be for those that want to be part of this situation. And we're totally okay with that. Well, Los, I think that's a good place to end it. That's uh, some great <laughs> sage yeah. wisdom once again. Uh, so before we let you go, tell our listeners where they can track down more about Catalyst and uh, connect with you online. Yeah, Catalyst, we're on all the uh, social media platforms. If you just search for Catalyst Marketing, you'll find it. So on some of the platforms, it's Catalyst Marketing Denver. Um, it's catalystmarketing.io is the website. Um, you can catch some of it there. Of course, we are still working on all that, but you can get a, a, a glance at what the agency has been doing and um, sort of the overall brand proposition there. You'll be seeing some updates happening over the next few months as well on our website. And then for me, you can go to carlosmusquez.com and you can find me there. And uh, if you search on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, you'll you'll find me. And uh, obviously you're going to see lots of Traeger pictures. You're going to see Traeger pictures, <laughs> my dogs, and um, and auto racing. <laughs> we need to get you in on a brand deal. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, you know what? Maybe if I say it enough, they'll just send me something for free. Like, you know, you never know. <laughs> At least some pellets or something. Uh, there you go. Something. <laughs> well, this has been this has been awesome, Josh. Thanks for having me. Um, so so happy to be on here. So great talking to you and catching up, man. Ah, great to see you again. And thank you for being obsessed with design. You got it. Take care. Okay, kids, that's episode number 172 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. 
Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.